welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Juwan Howard and the team are off to a solid start this season. Two big tests this week, though. Maryland on the road New Year's Eve and Red Hot Northwestern at home this Sunday. Joining us on our game day segment in just a moment will be beat writer James Hawkins from the Detroit News. First, a few of my thoughts to get us started. It could be any day now that we get the official report that Jim Harbaugh's contract extension is a done deal. Chris Ballas from the Wolverine reported earlier this week it is a done deal, and Chris would not go public unless he knew it was true. Watching Michigan football was pure agony for most of us this fall. It was a season to forget, and let's hope that it was an aberration. Basketball, on the other hand, has been fun to watch. My expectations for this team were fairly low when the season started. Now they're off to a 7-0 start, and I'm beginning to think this might be a better team than I thought it was originally. Of course, there is a long way to go, and COVID will be with us all season, rest assured. But right now, Jawan Howard is putting together what looks like a very good seven or eight man rotation that can compete with anyone in this brutal Big Ten. Nine teams are ranked in the top 25 as of this morning. It's going to be a fun season. My guest today says he didn't know what to expect either from this team when the season started. He thinks they could be a mid pack team. But they have the talent to make a push in the conference race if they get a few breaks. Up next on our game day segment is beat writer James Hawkins from the Detroit News on this our year ending edition of the Michigan Man. So stay with us. Here with us on our game day segment to talk Michigan hoops is beat writer James Hawkins from the Detroit News. Been a while, James, but it's good to have basketball back in action, isn't it? Oh, definitely, especially after the off season and how the how last season ended, and you know, obviously it was cut short with the uh, COVID pandemic. Yeah, it definitely seems like it has been an eternity since. Uh, <laughs> since college basketball has been here, but yeah, oh, definitely yeah. Uh, glad that it's been back on track and hasn't, I mean, Michigan at least hasn't had uh, too many problems or disruptions with uh, with the pandemic, thankfully. No, you're right. And as we uh, discussed for a moment before we started taping, we saw how COVID impacted the college football season, in particular Michigan's up close and personal. We've been lucky so far, both in the Big Ten and nationally, but I think we have to realize, uh, as you said, once you get to playing two games a week and you're traveling, that getting this 25-game season in is going to be a bumpy road, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. I mean, how teams get to handle with the disruptions and everything. But obviously, Michigan has, I guess, got a, uh, a crash course in that already with yeah. you know their ACC Big Ten Challenge matchup getting canceled with NC State. And then they had to kind of scramble within, like, you know, one day to find an opponent and they were able to find the you know, Toledo to get that scheduled. Well, we'll see. I mean, obviously, you know, the basketball has a, I would think, a better plan because they have the built-in buffers, you know, with like a little extra time off so in case there is cancellation. So I think it's a little bit more thought out than how football was where they're just kind of trying to plow through it without any sort of bias to make up for canceled games. So. Yeah. But hopefully it doesn't get to that point. But I think basketball, you know, obviously, like I said, they have the built-in extra time off to kind of make up games. So I think it hopefully it will go a little bit smoother in terms of trying to get all these games played this season. Well, James, one of the questions I get from a lot of my listeners is uh, the formula. How is it? Uh, how does it work? And I never really understood the formula during football season or how many positives it took to uh, you know shut down a program, keep a player out. Can you tell my listeners, to the best of your understanding for Big Ten basketball, what is the formula that's going to determine? If a team can play, if a player has to sit out or games need to be canceled. I mean, I wouldn't consider myself an expert in this either. But, I mean, obviously with football, you know, there's a much larger roster. I think mm-hmm. there's a certain percentage that had to be healthy in order for the team to continue on. But obviously with basketball, you're only dealing with, I mean, with Michigan, they only have 12 scholarship players. And I think they only have 17 on the roster counting the walk on. So, I mean, obviously if you probably get, you figure some of these guys are living together. So if you get, one positive case, you're probably going to have multiple. I think it's going to be hard to maybe just get one positive case. I think for basketball, I mean, obviously, like I said, if you probably get a couple positive cases, it's not going to be good. I, but I, I admittedly, I don't I don't even really know, I guess, the, the number mm-hmm. that it would take for games to get canceled or 
or, or or what would happen. But I just know that Michigan hasn't had any kind of disruptions with, with COVID and dealing with it just because they've been living in this soft bubble, quote unquote, on campus, you know, with students off campus and then they're kind of, you know, going to practice and then going back to their apartments and that's really about it. But yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly like how many positives there would need to be for them to have games called off. I think it just seems like it's more at the discretion of teams whether they feel like they can play or not. And I guess mm-hmm. teams, you know, and their opponent coming up and making that decision. But yeah, I would just, like I said, I just think, you know, with players are probably living together. So, I mean, if you get one case, you're probably going to get multiple cases. But I don't know if there's a, what the percentage is, so to speak, for, for basketball in order for games to to get called off. I would just assume anytime it's multiple cases that they might look to reschedule things because, mm-hmm. like I said, you're dealing with much, much smaller rosters with basketball compared to football. Right. Well, James, it's been a better than expected start for the team. Uh, and to me, the most pleasant surprise is uh, the play of Hunter Dickinson. Uh, your thoughts on what we've seen from him so far? Yeah, I completely agree. I think he's been a pleasant surprise and probably the biggest surprise so far this season. I think looking at the roster and heading into the year, he was obviously a person who had a chance to make an impact just given the fact that he's, he was going to have that opportunity with – him and Austin Davis as the only big men on the rosters. I think most people viewed Hunter as a guy who was eventually going to take over the, the starting spot and move into the starting lineup just because, I mean, obviously with Austin Davis at this point of his career, he kind of is what he is at this point. You know, he's just a reliable big man who can get you a few buckets and grab some rebounds and, you know, play some solid defense, but he's not really going to do much else, you know, more than that. It's not like he was going to start shooting three-pointers all of a sudden you know, this late <laughs> in his career. But yeah, but with Hunter, I thought like the one thing coming in, you know, you see with a lot of young guys in the Big Ten is how they kind of struggle on the defensive end. But for him, I mean, I haven't really – it doesn't seem like he's really had a hard time adjusting at that end. I mean, I just think he, he kind of fits into what, you know, Juwan Howard wants to do. Like last year we saw Juwan Howard likes to feed the post. He likes to get the, you know, the ball on the block and kind of go through that. And that was the thing that we saw John Teske kind of struggled with, you know, how he was more so a guy that was – out on the perimeter and, you know, more in kind of the pick and pops and ball screens and stuff on the John B line. And then John Howard comes and he kind of wants to put him on the block and uh, use him more with his back to the basket, which I think John Tessie yeah. wasn't entirely comfortable with. But with Hunter, I think that's just kind of his, seems like that's his bread and butter and how he's more suited to play. And I think the biggest thing is, Juwan mentions it time and again, is just he talks about how he's years beyond his age. He plays like, you know, years beyond his experience. I think what you've been seeing so far is just his poise is, kind of his instincts and the biggest thing has been his vision i think you see that his passing ability has been really impressive his you know his ability to kind of find his open teammates and uh, granted it helps he's seven one and he can see over everybody but i mean yeah there's something to say when he's the only the only wolverine through seven games who scored in double figures every single game and I mean, teams have tried to stop him, and they just haven't been able to find an answer, and it's just been a a problem for whoever they face so far. Yeah, he's been very exciting to watch. And you mentioned Austin Davis. We know he's been out for, you know, a couple of weeks with, I think, well, it's an undisclosed injury, but has there been any update in the last week as to when he might be back? He has a plantar fasciitis. I don't even know if I'm saying that word right, but it's kind of, you know, he's dealing with a a right foot injury. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's going to be more of a pain tolerance thing moving forward. When he was ruled out, Juwan Howard said he was going to be out extended weeks, which is notable just because last season when Isaiah Livers was dealing with his injuries, he kept, he continually said that Isaiah was out, you know, day to day. It was a day to day thing, and we kind of saw how that played out. With the first time he was out, he missed I think it was you know like four games or so, and then I mean we saw how he missed ten games total. But I mean throughout that entire thing, Juwan continuously said it was a day to day thing. So the fact that Juwan Howard said with Austin Davis is he's going to be out extended weeks. I mm-hmm. think it's um I think that's notable that he might be missing plenty of time. And I think last week he was asked for an update and he said there really wasn't one. Like I said, I think it's just going to end up being something where it's going to be like a pain tolerance thing for for Austin Davis and how he's going to kind of manage it whenever he's able to get back to uh, playing on the court. Well, on the offensive end, you mentioned that Hunter Dickinson is uh, the only player on the team averaging double figures uh, right now. Granted, it's early in the season. Franz Wagner is uh, one of the players we expected to be in double figures. Um, Not on fire through the first six games, but he had a big night against Nebraska. And I know he doesn't have to score 20-plus every night, but... He sure makes Michigan a much better team when he's in his groove, doesn't he? I mean, it's kind of funny because before the Nebraska game, Franz Wagner talked about how he wanted to be more aggressive on offense. Like, that was the one thing he looked back. Like, looking back at the first six games, he felt like he wasn't, you know, making as many plays and, and maybe taking advantage of the opportunities he was getting. But I think also Nebraska's game plan kind of allowed Franz to kind of have a bigger game because, as we saw, they were doubling on Hunter throughout the entire game and you know either on the touch or on the dribble so they were kind of trying to take him out of the offense which kind of opened things up for other guys so they kind of played perfectly into Franz and the one thing I got to say is 
Franz Wagner, we all know he like kind of came to came to Michigan. The one thing we heard is how like one of his strengths was his perimeter shooting, which is you know the one thing we haven't really seen so far this season. But his ability to kind of drive and finish at the rim has kind of been really impressive. He's been doing that very well this season, he, he, and he did it well last season too. But that's kind of been the one thing that really stands out with him is just his ability to kind of put the ball on deck and just kind of get to the rim and, and finish. And with him, I mean, as you pointed out, yeah, I think the expectation for him was to maybe take on a lead scoring role heading into the season, and that really hasn't been the case so far. As he's alluded to several times this season, though, I mean, for him and for Isaiah, it's kind of they've kind of had to adjust just because the offense last season, as we know, was so tethered to Xavier Simpson and everything he does. I mean, he had the ball so much, and he, you know, he was the one responsible for collapsing the defense and kind of setting up, you know, his teammates and creating for others. So that's kind of been an adjustment for France because, as we've seen, he's had the ball in his hands a little bit more, and he, he kind of has to create for himself now here this season. Which is, I mean, as opposed to last season, it was kind of he just kind of had to be in the the right spot just for Xavier to find him, and he all he had to do was really finish. So I mean, yeah, it's been an adjustment for him at that point, and I mean, it was obviously encouraging to see him, you know, kind of have a twenty point game at Nebraska. But the one thing for him, obviously, is you would just like to see his three-point shot you know, start falling right. a little bit more. I think he's only shooting 26% through seven games. But I think once he kind of gets, once he's able to dial it in, I mean, they'll obviously be huge. But it's one of those things, too, you got to wonder at what point is it kind of a concern when his threes aren't falling? Because we saw last year he got off to the slow start, too, and then he kind of ended last season on a tear. But this season, I mean, like I said, it's kind of a, one of those things where you wonder yeah. uh, what's going to happen if these threes don't start falling if he kind of just keeps shooting at this one clip you know it's, it's seven games into the season granted the uh, the big 10 the meat of the big 10 schedule is ahead of us and, and it's going to take time especially with a new quarterback on the floor but you know overall i've been surprised at the play of columbia transfer mike smith at the point and we knew we'd miss xavier simpson but he looks like a really nice fit so far doesn't he the biggest thing for mike obviously he, he came here he just wants to win i mean that's why he's here the same thing with him and shawnee brown i mean they were they're were at teams that really weren't winning programs during their careers and i mean that's all they want to do they just want to kind of play their role and help the team win and mm-hmm. obviously we know mike came here as a you know a prolific scorer he was one of the top scoring you know players in the nation last season and he was putting up like i think it was like you know 19 shots a game or something like that so i mean he obviously was like the lone consistent source of offense on his teams in years past on this Michigan team he has plenty of talent around him and talented pieces where he doesn't have to shoulder that load every uh, every single night so I think that's that's kind of helped him and he's been able to kind of just pick and choose his spots and yeah running the offense I mean I mean he's, he's been doing a fine job and I think if you look at these past two games that, that Michigan has had in the Big Ten I mean the, the game against Penn State and then the game at Nebraska I mean Mike has really come through when they've needed to because I mean if you look at that Penn State game late in the game when you know, Penn State was up. You know, when Michigan got those last two baskets on from Hunter Davidson, I mean, it was Mike Smith that was setting those up for him. And then the game at Nebraska, I mean, when it was, you know, when Nebraska was kind of making that push, the ball again was in, you know, Mike Smith for those crucial stretches where he kind of hit those two timely shots. And then he kind of got those two assists. He got the one to Eli and then the one to Franz to kind of put them back up eight points at it was with you know three minutes left and kind of put the game out of reach for them at that point. So yeah, I think Mike has been, you know, just solid. I don't think like, when he came here, I don't think the whole the whole thing was you don't need him to score, you know, in bunches mm-hmm. like he had to at Columbia. You just need him to kind of facilitate for others and kind of make, you know, shots when they're open. And then the big thing for him is just to play adequate defense, really, because obviously in the backcourt with Eli, Eli's probably going to take on the tougher guard matchup, so Mike just has to kind of hold his own on the defensive end. And so far, I think he's been able to do that through two Big Ten games, but obviously he'll still have to continue to prove himself on that end as, you know, when Michigan kind of plays, you know, the tougher tougher teams uh, in Big Ten play. Well, so far this season, uh, Jawan has gone deep with his bench, at least through the first six games. Do you think he'll settle into a, a seven or an eight-man rotation now that we're into Big Ten play? Yeah. It seems like he's already kind of trimmed it down because if you look at the first two Big Ten games, it seems like they've been relying on seven-man rotation with just the starting lineup with, you know, Hunter, Isaiah, Franz, Eli, and Mike, and then Sean D's kind of that six-man off the bench, and then Brandon's kind of been the the guy filling in for, you know, either Hunter or Isaiah. So it just seems like they've, they're have they going to that seven-man right now just because Austin's out, so I would assume they might go to more of an eight-man uh, when he's able to play. But yeah, like as you said, during the non-conference play, they're more going like a 10-man rotation, being including that was, you know, the freshman Terrence Williams the second, and then Zeb Jackson. They've seen limited minutes since Big Ten play has started up, especially Terrence. I think he's still seen a few minutes in yeah. the Big Ten games. But yeah, I think right now it's, Juwan Howard is going to be leaning on his, uh, you know, the more experienced players right. here early on in Big Ten play. But yeah, like I said, I mean, I think it also depends on just kind of how games play out and everything. Michigan hasn't, they've been lucky they haven't really had to deal with foul trouble yet in Big Ten games. So obviously that would 
they'll factor into rotation. But but right now, I think with that, with Austin Davis out, I think you're going to see like Juwan probably wants to rely on maybe just the seven man mix that he kind of has going right now. And then he can obviously dive into the bench if he needs to. You know, if, if foul trouble strikes, just because as we said, he kind of was you know playing the ten guys throughout non conference play, so it won't be like he's really you know throwing him into the fire, so to speak. Well, for years under John Beeline, not turning the ball over was a point of emphasis, and for most of his tenure. Michigan was, you know, one of the best in the Big Ten and in the country in that category. And not that Juwan and his staff don't emphasize the same thing, but they really have to clean up that part of the game, don't they? They're turning it over quite a bit. That's kind of something I noticed, too. I think they, I mean, in Big Ten play, I think they, they lead the league in, like, turnovers per possession. I think, according to Ken Palm, I think they're turning it over on 20% or 22% yeah. of their offensive yeah. possessions, which obviously isn't good. I think... Like I said, I think some of that can be contributed to, obviously, without the team just kind of adapting their offense and adjusting, um, obviously, without Xavier. I mean, as we said, he was the one who had the ball in his hands all the time last season. So now you have different guys that are kind of trying to handle the ball for the, the first time at this level. And I guess it's still, you know, they're still kind of going through that adjustment period, getting used to it. So I think that's, you know, what you can contribute it to with guys like Franz and Isaiah and them kind of trying to handle the ball and put it on the deck more. I mean, obviously, yeah, that is a concern seven games in. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I mean, in past years, you'd have, you know, you'd have like your 11-game non-conference schedule to kind of work up the kinks a little bit. So, I mean, here now, it's like you only had those, you know, those five non-conference games and then you kind of dive into Big Ten play. So, I don't think that has helped. But, yeah, I think it is a, it is a concern just seeing uh, the high clip that they're turning it over. But granted, I mean, Michigan's offense, so I think they have one of the best, one of the better, like, you know, effective field goal percentage. I think every game they've shot – I think it's that guy at least 45% from the field or something. So, I mean, I think that's kind of helped, you know, overlook that and kind of help them overcome those those turnovers that they've had. But, yeah, definitely if they hit one of those rough shooting games or, you know, if they don't shoot over 40% and then they still kind of turn it over in double figures in a game, I think that's really going to to show. So far, I mean, they've been able, like I said, they've been able to overcome it just because their, their offense has been, you know, effective and efficient enough to kind of help them offset the amount of turnovers yeah. that they've had so far. Well, on the other side, uh, defense, uh, what are your thoughts on what you've seen on the defensive end of the floor from this team so far? Defensively, I think they've been solid. I mean, obviously, I think there's room to grow, especially one-on-one defense. Through the non-conference slate, I feel like more so you just saw it was more so just them on offense, just kind of just out shooting teams and outscoring teams, yeah. so to speak. And then I think the one thing that kind of stood out is in the in the Big Ten over against Penn State. I think they showed that they can get stops when they need it because, as, as we saw, it was kind of that back-and-forth game. And then, you know, Penn State had the lead there late, and then – after Michigan took the took the lead, they kind of got those stops when they needed them down the stretch. And, you know, the one key stop was obviously on the final possession where Eli Brooks kind of, you know, warded off his guy one-on-one and kind of was stuck on the guy's hip and forced a, you know, a missed shot there at the rim. But, I mean, they have capable defenders, obviously. I mean, Franz Wagner, Eli Brooks, Mizead, I mean, they're all solid defenders. Yeah, I mean, I think there's obviously room to grow there. And that's another that's another thing, too, is if you look at their, their conference-only defensive stats, I think they actually lead the Big Ten and, you know, like points per possession. Right. So it's kind of weird that like you, you, you might look at it and you might be like, oh, I mean, they're not playing. You know, their defense maybe could use some work, but then you look at the numbers and the numbers show that they're actually doing a, a fine job. I think that's the one thing that several players have noted, though, that everyone thinks the offense is fine and that they're going to have to win more on the defensive end. So I think there's there's room for growth there. Um, but like I said, I think that that Penn State game, kind of getting into a, that kind of grinded out type of battle, I think they at least showed they can kind of get those stops when they need it. So I mean that was a positive sign. But as we know in the Big Ten, I mean I don't know on how many nights you know Machine's going to be able to score you know 80 plus points a game as they were throughout the non-conference right. uh, slate. So I mean obviously there are going to be games that, that they're going to have to slug it out and grind it out and get stops. So they'll have to continuously prove that. But but so far I mean it's it's at least you know been a positive sign that they've they've shown at least for a game that. They can they can get those stops late in the game when when they need to dig down and get them. Yeah, I agree. So far, so good. Two games this week though: on the road against Maryland on Thursday, New Year's Eve, and then home on Sunday to play a red hot Northwestern. Your thoughts on how Michigan matches up with the Terps down there and the Wildcats back here at Chrysler on Sunday, James? I've been like I guess box score watching more though more so than I have been actually watching the games. Mm-hmm. Um, both Maryland, I mean, the one thing that kind of stood out with them is early on in Big Ten play, they their offense was pretty much struggling and they kind of got off to the only two start. And then as we saw last night against, you know, they go on the road against Wisconsin and they, and they knock them off for their first win, which was pretty impressive. And I think they, the one thing with them is that their, their offense was kind of out of sync in their, in those first two big 10 games. And then, I mean, at Wisconsin, they, 
I think they closed the game making like 16 or 19 shots or something like that. But obviously, I think, you know, Maryland, they were a team that I think, you know, a lot of people expected to maybe finish towards the bottom of the standings because they obviously had two two big key losses in Jalen Smith and Anthony Cowan. They were kind of a core of, of good players. I mean, they have Aaron Wiggins, um, you know, Ayala, Dante Scott. They have key pieces there to build around. And, I mean, I think if we've seen anything so far in these first few weeks from I mean, Big Ten play, that it's that, you know, you can't take any team lightly. And, no. you know, any – any team is capable of beating anyone any night. And that's the biggest thing I think we've seen with, with Northwestern. I mean, they've, they're kind of just one of the, the teams that I think they just, that's what helped them is that they've just gotten older. I mean, they have a lot of their players back, but I obviously didn't see them making this type of a jump so far. I mean, obviously, as you pointed out, they've, they've been the biggest surprise. I think most people thought them and Nebraska were going to be the, the seller dwellers again this year. And I mean, through, through three games and Northwestern's at the top of the standings, obviously three and oh, with the with the wins over Michigan State and Ohio State, and then they went on the road and beat Indiana too. So they've proven they've they're not going to be no pushover. But like I said, I mean the Big Ten, I think it's kind of so far it's played out how you know many expected how it's just going to be a uh, one of those things where anyone can lose on any given night. And I mean if you look at it was last year, I think is what well, fourteen and six was the record that you know won the Big Ten last year. And I mean so far it makes you wonder if anyone's even going to get to fourteen wins this season, just given you know kind of how the teams at the bottom of the standings are have kind of already been beaten up on the teams at the top. So it's going to be interesting. But obviously, I mean, you know, Michigan's not going to be able to take any any nights off, and that game at Maryland's not going to be easy. And then I mean, even when they when they host Northwestern, I mean, if Michigan's you know not locked in from the tip i mean they can they can move mm-hmm. they can be upset and be handed their first big 10 loss well as surprising as northwestern is the uh, the shock to me has been over in east lansing with michigan state they were waxed by minnesota up there last night and they're now 0 and 3 in big 10 play uh, Izzo has got to be out of his mind about now doesn't he i mean obviously for certain teams in the rise in the big 10 other teams have got to fall and so uh unfortunately for Michigan State that's been them so far and I think for them I mean I've, I've watched a little bit of them and I think for them I think the biggest thing has just been I mean obviously replacing Cassius Winston is a huge void to fill but I just kind of think their, their point guard thing their point guard situation has kind of hasn't really solved itself I guess it's kind of been a something they're trying to figure out I think after the game like Rocket Watts said he wasn't really comfortable playing the point or something like that and he prefers to play off the ball and that's why they made the lineup switch so I mean I guess that's not really a good sign after you know do not conference play guy's not you know maybe comfortable playing the point so it's going to be something i guess that the Spartans are going to have to kind of figure out on the fly to kind of solve that situation obviously on the defensive end too i mean they lost xavier tillman who was you know i mean he was the defensive player of the year and i mean obviously that's that's a huge void to fill i think his voice he had the huge voice and he was you know the guy who communicated and got everyone in their places i'm on defense and i think that i mean I think so far, it's just those two losses. I mean, you've kind of seen how much it's been hard for Michigan State to kind of fill those voids. Um, obviously, with Cassius on offense and Xavier on defense, it's definitely been a surprise seeing them start off on three, just because Michigan State's you know success they've had in Big Ten play, and I mean they were a team that was viewed to kind of contend for the title up there with you know Illinois, Iowa, and uh, and Wisconsin. They were they were kind of up there. People were giving them a chance to four peat, but it's gonna be tough for them to kind of dig out that own three hole though especially given the, the depth of the, the Big Ten this year. It's going to be kind of a uh, tough challenge to turn it around, though. Oh, absolutely. But something tells me uh, Coach Izzo will uh, get this thing figured out. Too much talent there, but it's going to uh, it's going to take some time. You can't just hit on all cylinders um, every year, all year. So he'll, he'll get it together. But for now, when you look at the Big Ten, and granted we are really early in the season, would you say Illinois, Iowa, and Wisconsin – look like the teams to beat in the conference for me like i think wisconsin i know like i know illinois and iowa they have the talent they have the big names obviously illinois has iowa DeSumo and kofi coburn and iowa has you know luca garza you know the national player of the year more than likely and then you know they got the talented pieces around him and joe Wieskamp and uh jordan bohan and cj frederick but coming into the year i thought like wisconsin i felt like was the i felt like it was the favorite just because they returned like almost the entire team yeah. from last season yeah. and they have the most experience of any team i mean you can't you can't like replace winning experience. I mean, that's, I think it's a huge thing that people are overlooking. I mean, they obviously, I mean, just given the way that they kind of closed out last season and the tear they went on just to even win a share of the title, I think that's the Zions. But yeah, I, I mean, obviously those three are, I think are the, the, the key teams to be. But for me, I think Wisconsin, I would, I would put them above Iowa and Illinois. And I know others probably would put, you know, the other two above Wisconsin. But yeah, I just think like the experience that they have. I mean, every I think they have like everyone in their second line senior or fifth year senior. So I mean, they have guys that have you know been through the ringer and kind of know what it takes to win and on a on a nightly basis in the Big Ten. And I mean Iowa. I mean I don't 
for them, they, they got to still show that they can defend, at, like you know, at a championship level. I mean, obviously yeah. their offense is yeah. is a buzzsaw, but I mean, there's there's going to be nights though where they kind of their offense is, isn't you know kind of firing all cylinders, and they're going to have to lock down and play defense. And I don't think I don't think they've kind of shown that yet where they can win a game playing defense. In Illinois, obviously, I think it's just kind of that two man show there with you know Io and Kofi. So I mean, you kind of wonder if you know one of those guys has an off night. You know what can happen, but they obviously have. They have two talented freshmen, Adam Miller and Andre Cabrillo, though, too. Those have been two bright spots. But, yeah, I just think, I, just for me personally, I just think I or I just think Wisconsin maybe is the, the team to watch in terms of, you know, obviously teams to mm-hmm. beat just because they – it's like this – just for them, it's just the same style of play. They have, like, the same formula. They still make teams kind of grind out possessions. And then you just throw in the fact that they return almost, you know, the entire, you know, core of their roster. And then plus they get in the whole season of Michael Potter, too, who is, you know, who probably should have been the sixth man of the year last year. So yeah, I think for me, Wisconsin's the team to beat, and then obviously Illinois and Iowa, though they're they're right up there too. And and for Michigan, I mean, the, the thing with them is uh, obviously they kind of have a favorable favorable schedule this year, where they you know they only get they only have to face Iowa and Illinois um, once, and they get them both at home. So mm-hmm. uh, and that's kind of a kind of helps out Michigan kind of case, you know, when it comes to contending for the Big Ten title this year. And James, if times were normal, and we know they are not, uh, road wins in hostile arenas would be very hard to come by in this conference, really anywhere in the in the country. But how much of a difference does it make to uh, go on the road now and there's no one in the stands? Look what happened in Madison uh, with Maryland walking and getting a victory. How much of a difference do you think that makes? Obviously, I think it makes a, a big difference just because as you as you allude to, I mean, obviously, when you're on the road, um, the crowd noise does have an effect, obviously, when things get going. I mean, you can kind of feel the, you know, feel the momentum shifts, and obviously, the noise can affect communication. Obviously, you know, if the crowd's roaring and uh, kind of, you know, I have a hard time maybe hearing guys, but yeah, so I think now it's like you have to, you kind of have to create your own energy if your teams, but I think that obviously helps road teams just because you're not having to deal with those, you know, those other variables, those other factors, obviously with the, with the crowd making an impact and getting behind the home team. But yeah, I think just like the big thing is going to be the benches, you know, kind of maybe helping, you know, provide that energy and that spark, you know, kind of make filling in that void that maybe the, the, you know, the fans would make, you know, kind of getting behind the team. But I think it's, it's maybe easier four road teams to maybe kind of stop stop runs because I mean I feel like in, you know if you look at past seasons kind of when a team kind of gets gets going a little bit the crowd gets into it kind of a team is able to kind of rip off you know maybe one of those game changing type runs yeah um, and I think that's kind of the thing this year that maybe the crowd without having you know the crowds I think that's one thing that teams are maybe able to kind of overcome a little bit more is maybe kind of prevent those those huge overwhelming runs at least early on now because, you know, the crowds aren't getting into it. But, but yeah, I think the biggest key, though, for road teams now is just having the benches. The benches are going to play a bigger role and just kind of maybe providing that energy and having, the you know, the players on the court feed off that. And then I think, too, obviously, uh, the experience is going to play a big factor just because, I mean, you're going to have guys, like like I said, with communication and stuff. Um, I think there's another thing, too. I mean, obviously, you can maybe hear more than what you could hear in seasons past. So you're going to have to, like, know what, what to listen for and, and stuff like that and instead of like listening for everything so yeah, i think experience maybe helps with with these type of things but i mean a lot of a lot of players have kind of you know pointed to that's kind of like scrimmages so to speak so it's not really something that's totally new to them just going on the road i think it's going to be i think it's going to be easier for teams in the big 10 this year yeah. to maybe win on the road than it has been in years past just given that there's they're not having to deal with the the crowd factor and all the, the challenges that that can present oh absolutely i agree with that it's going to be a strange year in that sense i think it's also strange for you guys in, in the media i mean are you covering all the games remotely this season and then just doing zoom post-game pressers yeah so for home games we're still going to we're still at curricular center oh, okay. um, there's just a limited limited number of media i think it's 20 or 25 media is allowed so we're still in the we're still in the same like press area Chrysler, chrysler it's just more spaced out so i think in a row it typically was like i think it was like eight people in a row i think it was something like that and now it's just three people in a row so it's, you know it's just a seat at each end and one in the middle so we're spaced out and then yeah so they post game stuff obviously like during normal times we would you know go down to the to the media room and we would you know talk to the coaches there and get the players afterwards and that we do everything in person but now yeah everything is just done so we don't even leave the the media row area we just do the zooms rare for the game so everything's done over over laptops and then as far as road games i didn't go to the nebraska game i don't know if i'm going to really be flying four games just because 
I think the biggest reason we would go is for the media access because we would usually, you know, just get players outside locker rooms afterwards. And mm-hmm. now with everything being just done over Zoom, it kind of really defeats that purpose, so to speak. For road games, kind of just watching remotely, like, you know, just, just fans are just watching it off TV. And then obviously after the games, we get, you know, the players and the the coach and a few players afterwards. So definitely is strange, but I mean, just in terms of just covering a game at home, it is a little weird just because, you know, they have the fake crowd noise pumped in nonstop. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So it is it is very odd covering home games this season for various reasons. But yeah, obviously still grateful that there's a season and oh, still yeah. have something to, to cover. I might go to some road games that are obviously drivable, but in terms of just flying the games, I uh, probably won't be doing that too much this season just because, like I said, we just kind of do everything over Zoom as it is. So it's just kind of been a, I mean, if anything, it's just kind of been a, a, weird, a weird year that shows everyone you just kind of have to adjust to, to how things are and just kind of make things work. Absolutely, and as you said, just be grateful we have uh, basketball right now. Final question for you, James, uh, before we let you get away. You know, based on what you've seen from this Michigan team, and we know it's a small uh, sample so far, at this moment, would you say it's a middle-of-the-pack team, or is it one that might have the pieces to uh, to be an upper-tier team and compete for the championship in the Big Ten? I think there's a good chance. Like, there's no doubt that they could be. They can finish in the top five in the Big Ten, just because uh, obviously they've gotten off to this 2-0 start. And as I, as I pointed out, I think they have they have a favorable Big Ten schedule this year, which certainly will help their cases. And, I mean, I think if you just look at their schedule early on, I mean, I think they have a, a favorable schedule. As you pointed out, they play, you know, at Maryland this weekend, and they, and they host Northwestern at home. And then after that, they got Minnesota and Penn State. I think in terms of, obviously, if, if you look at all the pieces that they kind of are bringing in, and I think this helps this the Big Ten schedule that they have early on, just with them kind of, the new the new faces and the new pieces that they have kind of maybe gelling even more, kind of building that chemistry to kind of maybe help them get on a roll as opposed to if they had, you know, they faced like a, a daunting stretch early on that maybe would put them in a hole. I think here they can maybe, like I said, they can kind of rack up some wins and maybe, you know, kind of help separate themselves a little bit. But obviously they're going to they're gonna get into that stretch. I mean, if you look at the back end of their schedule, it's going to be a grind because those are the games they have against, you know, they're going to face, you know, Illinois, Wisconsin, Rutgers, uh, Iowa, Michigan State. It's not going to be easy. Uh, the closing stretch of the schedule. So uh, this this early stretch, I think, is where they're going to have to rack up wins to kind of maybe keep themselves towards the top of the standings. So I think the true point of the schedule, where they're going to have to prove themselves and they're going to show whether they're really worthy of you know competing for a title, is going to be like that back end, kind of like the final you know eight eight or nine games that they have of the schedule. So I think they have a a favorable slate early on, which is going to help them and kind of aid their case to kind of stay top of the standings. But then, you know, when it gets down to it, they're going to have to show down that closing stretch. They're going to have to show whether they're, you know, they're actually going to be contenders or not. But yeah, it's going to, it, it should be a, it should be a, a interesting, fun, compelling season. And uh, uh, it's going to be interesting to see if, you know, if any team is even going to be able to, you know, really pull away in, in the things, which I don't think is going to be the case. I think it's going to be a grind it out, slug it out type of thing. And hopefully like last season, it's a, maybe it's a big 10 race that kind of goes down to the, to the last game of the season. Um, I think that would make it, make it more compelling. But yeah. definitely, I think Michigan, so far, I think they've shown they have the pieces and the talent to at least, you know, compete, uh, you know, put themselves in contention, you know, to be up there towards the, towards the top of the standings. But um, obviously a long way to go. And like I said, the, the closing stretch of their schedule is really going to show, you know, whether they're, you know, going to be a true contender in the Big Ten this season. Well, here with us on our game day segment this week as we uh, really close out the year with our last show of uh, 2020 has been beat writer James Hawkins from the Detroit News. James, uh, great to have you back on the show after uh, uh, quite a lengthy time. And um, as we've discussed today, it's just great to have college basketball back. So it's uh, going to be an interesting new year for the Michigan Wolverines. And we look forward to uh, having you back uh, very soon. So until then, take care of yourself. A very happy new year to you. And we look forward to that next visit. All right, sounds good. Happy new year to you and all your listeners. On Quick Hits today, Cam McGrone and Quinn Nordine have both announced they will make themselves available for the NFL Draft. The good news this week was that Aiden Hutchinson will return for his senior year, which is huge for our defense next year. We need all the help we can get in the trenches. Again, basketball has two big tests this week, Maryland on the road New Year's Eve and Northwestern at home this Sunday. 
In other news, hockey will be back in action Friday, January 8th when they entertain the Spartans. Coach Kim barnes Rico and the ladies will be back in action on New Year's Eve with a matinee contest against Wisconsin. COVID numbers forced cancellation of their last few games. It's going to be a busy winter on the Michigan sports scene. Hopefully we can avoid outbreaks that will lead to more cancels. It's going to be a battle, though. So that's it for 2020. I have to say I won't miss one thing about this year. It has been very long for all of us. I have to think the future will be brighter next year. We have the vaccine, and hopefully as the year progresses as a nation, we will get this virus under control and return to life as we remember it. At least we can hope so anyway. So let's end the year on a positive note. I would like to thank each and every one of you for downloading and listening to this, my little labor of love. There were plenty of times this year there really wasn't much to talk about, but we kept to our regular schedule, and we did the best we could. So we'll be back next week with our first show of the new year, which will also be our 12th year of bringing you what we hope is a show that keeps you up to date on our Wolverines and brings you something each week that you find interesting. So thank you from the bottom of my amazing blue heart. Goodbye 2020. Happy New Year to each and every one of you. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Have a great New Year's Eve and day, everyone. Until we meet again in 2021, take care, and as always, go blue. Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man, here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network, and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Our listener lines are open 24-7 for your calls, at 313-263-4842. That's 313-263-4842. Or email us at the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. That's the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. The Michigan Man Podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go Blue!